Okay, so now I have to review what the students said. So Mia and Jack both uh, gave their reactions. They're, they're talking about whether virtue is learned or a matter of habit and uh, habituating children, right? And so um, the conclusion I think both of them came to was that children really learn whether to be virtuous or vicious. They learn whether to like being good or not. Um, so human beings, for human beings, culture is a second nature. Like you're not born virtuous or vicious, and yet that really becomes who you are, right? Throughout your life. And so that it's very, it's serious how a kid is raised. And in our country, it's so amazing because 50% of kids leave the hospital and any reasonable person would know they're gonna go into a toxic environment, right? They're not gonna get raised very well. And those aren't always poor, violent neighborhoods. Those are hyper rich neighborhoods. Those kids are corrupted also because they think they have to have that much stuff to be virtuous. And that'll then that prevents them from wanting a middle class. Does that make sense to you? That raising a kid with too much money is a corrupting influence, just as much as too little. And Aristotle does say that. I think that's a quote that I showed you, but it's definitely in his ethics. Um, so an example of a person with rational ambition is Rebecca Ferguson, who planned out her career and her goals step by step. So Mia got that, that's definitely true. And an example of ulterior motives is when somebody gives money away, but to make them look good, to further their public image, their popularity or their long-term power or whatever, they have some other major motive. And then uh, Jack talked about the Germans who hid Jews uh, during World War II, and they were courageous. Um, I actually know some people, I know two people who did that. One was living in Amsterdam, she was Dutch. And I went, I, she's a friend of mine, she lived in Little Rock. And I met her over in Amsterdam and spent the day with her there. And she was just telling the story about that. And then I also had a great uncle by marriage, who was a major player. He was a Baptist preacher and he hid Jews in the attic of his uh, church. And he was in um, Copenhagen before they got on the ship and got up to um, Sweden and Norway. And so, yeah, that, that hits close to home. And then um, the question of whether the reason you do something matters, right? So I think over time, you need to have good reasons and then you also need to be self-correcting, right? If you have the right reason, then when you make a mistake, you'll, you'll have in mind, you'll learn what you need to learn from that mistake and you won't make it again or you'll make a better judgment the next time. Do, does that make sense to you? It does matter what your ultimate motives are. What are you living for? Because then when the obstacles hit, you'll know where you're headed. Um, okay, so now I'm just gonna go over the some of the charts and I'll stop every once in a while since there's only two of you and we can discuss it, right? So I'll start out with this long list. And it's long, you could spend two hours just going over the list. But um, the idea is the goal is to flourish. Somebody, all of their capacities are being exercised at the highest level possible over a lifetime, right? So um, we can understand these patterns. That's why Aristotle's ethic, this list of definitions 
is a list of patterns that have been recognized over time. Um, we're born with the potential to develop, to develop them. Um, the two most important ones are self-control and courage because those are the ones tied to the brainstem. Those are the ones connected to our basic, primitive, primal, reptilian instincts, right? And so, especially sex drive, because it's so powerful. But, you know, eating not too much, not too little. You eat the right thing for the right reason in the right way at the right time. You don't eat for emotional reasons. You don't, you know, you guys, this is common sense, right? And you take pleasure in it, right? You're you're totally at peace with yourself. Uh, how many people, how many Americans do you think have really got it set in stone? They have the virtue in relation to eating. <laughs> Maybe one in 20, does that make sense? Because we tend to eat, you know, there's a lot of bad food out there. So, and eating for emotional reasons, and all sorts of stuff. Um, then there's drinking alcohol, too much, too little, the mean. Um, and then there's sex, too much, too little, the mean. Uh, with drinking, uh, the joke I have is that, well, people disagree on what the mean is. So some people will say, I only drink on holidays, right? Some people, I only drink on weekends. Some people, um, I only drink at night, right? <laughs> and some students probably only have one drink before philosophy class because it makes a lot more sense then, right? So, so people disagree on how much is too much. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this, I don't drink. And the reason is because 7% of the population anywhere is prone to alcoholism and really shouldn't be drinking at all. And they affect at least three other people's lives. So over a lifetime, any one person profoundly affects at least three other people, right? That's 28% of the population. So that's huge. Um, my father didn't drink because his family was pretty much ruined by alcohol. So that's why I don't drink. Um, but I don't judge people who do. It's just getting the habit of, it's not about me, it's about citizenship. What's the best way to promote the flourishing of everyone? Okay, then with sex, People disagree on whether um, any kind of non-binary, non-heterosexual orientation is um, within the mean. Some people are just born that way or at an extreme, right? So we have the science, we've had a lot of debates about that. Then there are um, disagreements about prenatal, Pre, prenatal, premarital sex, right? Or extramarital sex. Or I had a friend who decided he had an open marriage, right? Oh, there's a philosopher. Have any of you ever heard of open marriage? <laughs> I say only philosophers can delude themselves into this kind of stuff. Yeah, this guy, he had a cabin. And he, he and his wife agreed that whenever they wanted to have an affair, they could go use the cabin, you know. Uh, but I, I just, I think the guy used it a lot more than the woman did, frankly. Um, anyway, so people disagree on that. And then in some cases, the natural, the, the common weakness is too much. So with eating, a lot more people drink eat too much than too little. Although, you know, too little and ex, um, whatever, the eating too little can get to be a huge problem. 
And then drinking, it's usually too much. And sex, it's usually too much, right? With generosity, it's usually too little. People don't give away enough. With courage, it's the relation to fear. So you can be afraid of physical pain, of sickness, of death, but especially of failure to achieve in the economic system, loss of status, uh, getting kicked out of society, all those things. So you should think about all the ways that people compromise and seriously uh, compromise, sometimes, you know, really make the wrong choice, not because of pain or death, but because of failure. They think they're not going to succeed in the economic sector. That's why I think if you run a business, you can consider yourself, if you're really good at running a business and you really want all your employees to flourish and you set it up that way, that's a kind of missionary because when you're running a business, you have a lot of power. People have to have jobs. And so you can make people's lives miserable and you can exploit them. Um, or humili humiliate them, send them off with a black mark on their CV. You know, it's just an incredibly powerful position. And a lot of people compromise a lot just to, to succeed. And that's another reason why greed is such a corrupting influence in the sense that people, if people just think having a middle class is okay, then maybe if they disagree with what their company's doing, they think it's unethical, they can find another job. But if people insist on making a lot of money or having a lot of power, then they will have to compromise to get there. They're much more likely to get corrupt, corrupted by that. Generosity is very important. And the giving away money or time this is when we debate, really, whether public schools, public health, public transportation, giving away money isn't just philanthropy, it's also the tax structure, right? How much money, how much of our each person's resources ought to go to the well-being of everybody? And we debate that a lot. And sometimes we debate, um, whether the institutions to distribute that, like educational institutions, whether they're set up well, right? Sometimes they're not set up very well. Sometimes they're set up well, but they're not managed well, right? And so there's all these layers of uh, promoting human well being. That's why learning how to be a good citizen you really have to start making a lot of distinctions. And that's why I, the, the way politics is debated in the public arena in a whole lot of venues is completely oversimplified. That's why I don't follow it that much. But I, I wanna give you a tool, right? I wanna give you a set of categories and you can step back and say, now, this particular debate, which part of the chart is this about, right? Um, so anyway, generosity. Magnanimity is giving away a lot of money. So this is a big deal because right now the world is being run by billionaires who have very, very different goals in their uh, generosity, right? So the Koch brothers and the Koch political machine is giving billions of dollars to political campaigns to promote and preserve fossil fuels. And um, that's just for starters, but fossil fuels is a major goal for the Koch brothers. That's how they got all their money. Whereas Bill Gates has a uh, about, about a dozen billionaire friends. And he is just totally obsessed with getting us to zero carbon and sucking carbon out of the air. I 
I read a book, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster. He is aware of how multifaceted this problem is. And so among the billionaires, billions and billions is going to, uh, you know, goals that are totally at odds with each other. If we could just get everyone on the same page, you know, we could go green overnight, but we don't, we just have a terrible situation right now. And so that will change within the next 10 years. So because you're coming to college right in the middle of this, I do think a decent teacher would let you know that and you should stay up on it, whatever. Um, even tempered, not getting angry because there are many reasons that it kick, to get angry because we depend so much on other people and we depend upon social institutions, political institutions, uh, people running the institutions. So it's very easy to get frustrated and also get frustrated to the point where your own survival is at stake. So you get really angry. And so learning how to be even tempered is really important. Um, but the most extreme there is if you somebody harms you and you take revenge, right? That's way out, you know? That really undermines social cohesion. Uh, rational ambition that you just uh, decide in college what it is you're good at that you also, what's meaningful to you that you also think you are really helping other people. So it's where those two things come together, what makes you happy and what makes the society flourish. And you just, then you figure out, okay, what piece of paper do I have to get? What kind of license? What sort of internship? What's a good, you know, you just figure out within the system how to get the established and then eventually you can start doing it the way you envisioned it. It just takes a long time. I was 50 before I was finally able to say, screw it, I'm not going to do it the way that I was conditioned to do it. I don't believe in that. I'm going to do it my way. Um, and all of you, you know, you can do that. You just have to, you just have to know you're on the 20 year plan and just be patient. Um, Pride, knowing how to honor people. So doing on an honor day, every institution has an honor day. And that's for people who go above and beyond what their contract acts, asks them to do. And they just create a really positive climate in the institution. And so um, Jennifer um, Heidi was somebody who did, was famous for that. She set up all sorts of recycling um, programs just on her own, just to help with the community of Lyon. Uh, Deborah Dickey is always there for you. You can mention a lot of people in the staff and also faculty that go over and beyond, and that's honorable. Um, a lot of uh, people who deserve honor don't necessarily get it but they don't complain about it because it just makes it look like they're ambitious for honor. They just let it go, but they make sure that the people who are doing honorable things get honored because you want your society to honor people who do honorable things. And so in our society, for example, how much do we honor movie stars, and sports people as opposed to teachers, right? You know, who gets the most honor? And some of those people are worthy of honor, but you know, these other people are too. <laughs> so who is basically the culture honors is a symbol, you know, an indication of the nature of that culture. Um, and it is true that if you honor movie stars and sports people, a lot of people don't have those natural talents at that level. So you're dishonoring people for things that they just, it was a matter of being born with some of that. So, you know, 
to honor people who have made the effort and you know developed themselves there's just so much to be honor that's honorable that i don't think gets enough respect um humor is important uh otherwise you end up being frustrated all the time or depressed so you have to learn how you know i'm sure sometimes you make make light of things something stupid happens but you don't want to get cynical and just give up on any ideals but you you have to learn how to laugh things off without you know just not wanting to go forward and that's so it's important friendships are really important because uh, it helps you bounce your ideas off. They help you with deciding, making a good judgment. They might point out to you what you're not considering. They help you talk out the consequences, you know, everything. I just think um, the Greek view is one where dialogue with soulmates is really, really important. You don't just sit and, and apply principles in a vacuum. Um, you create a whole culture and climate, social fabric. Sociability is important, not to be petty. And just think about social media, how much gets unraveled of the social fabric gets unraveled because people will just diss each other for minor offenses. And that just creates a really bad climate. Uh, truthfulness, being truthful about who you are, not boastful and not self-deprecating. Okay, the political virtues are um, the pleasure that comes from making a profit. That's the whole business sector, but that's obviously not the most important one. In our society, it gets way overvalued. Um, and also you should, the virtue there is to want to be middle class, however middle class, whatever standard of living middle class is in your society at that time. Because when people are middle class, they can focus on citizenship and they all have skin in the game. They're all invested in the society. But if people are too poor, they can't think about quality of life. They can't think about citizenship they can't get engaged or involved or informed because they're just trying desperately to get food on the table so you can't have a real democracy if too many people are just working all the time and then on the other hand if people are too rich and they get out of touch and they just have no idea what the experiences of all these people around them are like so I just have a couple examples of that. Maybe you have an example. If you do, after I say this, you can raise your hand. But Wilbur Ross was the head of the commerce under Trump in Trump's cabinet. And he had gotten rich by exploiting um, the ho housing foreclosure disaster in 2007. He just took advantage of vulnerable people and he became a billionaire. And then um, when Trump was talking or he was talking about encouraging people to start their own businesses and stuff, and somebody was saying, well, are you gonna have some government programs for startup money for people so they can start their businesses? And he really said this, he said, well, they can always borrow money from their fathers. <laughs> Right, I mean, it didn't occur to him that not everybody has a rich father. Uh, Trump actually got 241 million bucks from his father. Um, so anyway, that's what happens when you get out of touch. There were five billionaires on Trump's cabinet who are deciding on public policy. Um, and then the other one was um, one of the wives of one of the people on a board at one of the colleges that I was at. I've been associated with five different small liberal arts colleges. So, and um, she said, you know, she came to give some money that her husband had put in a special account 
for Lyon College. And so now they were closing up that account. He had died, so they were closing up that account. And she said, you know, well, my husband always told me, you know, you just save a little bit of your money every month and pretty much it builds up. And, you know, I know she's thinking, how come these other people don't save money? But she has no idea what it means to live on 20, 22,000 bucks a year, right? She just, <laughs> she doesn't know. There's, there's no way they could save money. Does everybody understand that, that you really don't want people who are too rich or too poor? Because you can't have a democracy that way. Everybody has to be involved in the society. If you do make a lot of money, you don't have to raise your kids rich. So Warren Buffett was one of the richest people in the world. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he joined with uh, Gates. He put all of his money in with Gates so Gates could have this uh, foundation that does uh, you know, regular malaria and schools and all that uh, philanthropy, but also the zero carbon uh, engineering projects. But anyway, somebody interviewed his son, Peter, and they were, they lived in a, you know, a nice house in Omaha, and I guess they had a nice house in Florida, but, you know, he went to college, and somebody said, you're Warren Buffett's son? And like, Peter didn't even know what he was talking about, right? <laughs> his dad was one of the richest people in the world, but he did not raise his kid to be hoity-toity like that, which I think is great. Like, there's no need for a kid to know how much money their parents have. What the kid needs to know is that they have to grow up and make their own money, right? No kid should think they never have to go to work. That's a corrupting influence. But anyway, so Aristotle said, because of the tendency of the rich to, to get richer, money sticks to money, he wanted a very large inheritance tax so that either the rich would give their money away so that they wouldn't pay a tax when they die, or they pay this tax when they die. And there used to be a, a huge uh, tax. The, the rich in the US used to get taxed a lot more than they are now. Um, in the 1950s uh, under Eisenhower, if you didn't give your money away, it was a 91% tax on your, on your income or your wealth. And then under, um, Rake, under Nixon, it went to 75. Under Reagan, it went to 50. Under W. Bush, it went to 38. And under Trump, I think it went to um, no, 35 under Bush and something like 20, 22. So it's way, way, way uh, off kilter. So when you hear somebody say, ah, raising taxes, um, if you look at the historical, situation, the rich really need to be taxed more. And people like Warren Buffett, there are a number of billionaires that say, please tax us more because schools, all these things need uh, money. And I can't just go as a philanthropist, I can't start building bridges and roads you know, with philanthropy money. It's got to be government money. So you should tax us more. Um, anyway, so there's tax policy. Um, but legislation can also work. I mean, all the legislative debates, pub, uh, public health care, public whatever. Um, but in any business, you have laws and policies, right? You have rules, policies. That's the legislative part of any organization. Lion College has that. Um, then there's um, the institutional structure, how it's set up. Then it's the people that are actually fitting, filling in the roles. For example, you have a dean of students, I think. It used to be called dean of students. I don't know 
associate vice president for students or something. <laughs> anyway, so you know that when certain things come up, you go to that administrator. And so you can decide whether Lion has enough administrators to meet you know, all the needs of the school. And that's the cabinet. And then you have the person filling that post. Was the problem that that the same person really had two people's work to do? Or was it just the problem was the person who's in that post? And things like that. Like that's just so you're aware. I'm just opening your eyes to what's actually right in front of you, that every we are social and political beings. So every aspect of our lives is affected by these institutional structures that were created by a set of laws that decided this institution needs to be created and here's the structure. And then who's, uh, who, got, who got the job? Why did they get the job? Did they get the job because they were the boss's kid? or you know, friends, or they bribe someone and they're totally incompetent, or do they get it because they'd proven they were good? I mean, all that stuff matters. And then when it comes to laws, how to distribute wealth, right? And that's what I was talking about with taxes. And not only that, but so in Europe, um, here's, here's another way to think about this. The United States, from a purely business point of view, I think ranks third in the world or something, right? Whereas Germany, European countries rank lower because they tax their businesses more and they have more regulations. But on the other hand, Americans have, among the developed countries, some of the worst healthcare, the worst education, the worst you know, the most crime, the no rehabilitation programs. I mean, there's a price to pay, right? So it's not as if just being good for business means that we have a high quality of life or we're the best place to be. Um, it depends upon what you want and you get what you pay for, right? You don't pay for good schools, you don't get good schools, you know? So um, I, I do, want you to think just scoring high on business climate isn't necessarily the most important criteria you have to decide what you want um then rectifying wrongs how to punish so um again in europe especially norway they have a philosophy that what you should do because they want to prevent repeat offenders. That's, that's when it gets really expensive. Everyone can make a mistake, but try to set things up so you don't have kids growing up in toxic environments where you know there's a bunch of gangs, somebody's going to get hurt, someone's going to end up in prison for a long time and it'll cost you a ton of money. So try to prevent problems. If people do end up incarcerated, have them train for some skill, get, get them connected with someone. When they get out, they have a job and a place to live, and then they won't come back. They don't want to come back. But if you just punish, just punitive, you were naughty, you were bad, without any context, you don't give them any skills in prison, just punish. And then they're on the street. <laughs> yeah, no wonder we have repeat offenders. And it costs a lot of money. It costs a lot more than just having those programs to rehabilitate, to get people back in society. So there's different philosophies about that. Um, and then a judge is somebody who takes the laws and apply them to particular cases. And right now in our history, the big issues there are, there Trump appointed three Supreme Court justices. And so now the, the court is um, six and three, and it really shouldn't be that ideologically driven. It shouldn't be based on ideas. It should be related to the situation. 
So an Aristotelian judge doesn't look, you know, looks at the situation. But right now, there's just a huge disagreement about what our constitution really means for uh, the situations today. So with um, COVID, uh, Mr. Biden had a mandate for businesses that they would have to, workers would have to get uh, vaccines or tested every day or something. And the Supreme Court knocked it down, okay? And, you know, the judges that dissented said this is, uh, this, the, actually there are laws on the books, occupational safety and hazard. So it is illegal to subject your uh, employees to occupation related hazards and health, health, threats to their health, right? There are laws saying that the work environment has to be healthy. But the six justices did not interpret um, mandates for COVID to mean that. So that's just a disagreement in how the laws apply. Um, does that make sense? And the abortion thing is gonna be huge. And so I don't know, again, I don't know how engaged you wanna get in this. When I was in college, I was like, I was clueless about the Supreme Court. Um, even though, I mean, Roe v. Wade was passed then, you know, <laughs> I was not a political junkie. I was aware of stuff. So when I'm asking you to be aware, it's not listening to the news every day. I was not at all like that, but I was aware of things. So um, just to be aware that Supreme Court justices, you could just vote uh, you know, your whole vote for president could be based on what Supreme Court justices you anticipate that they would put on if it, an opening comes. And that could be your single issue vote because of the impact that these people have. Um, and I was totally unaware of that. Anyway, that's the virtue of equity. And we're having a lot of disagreements in our society about whether Supreme Court justices have that virtue. And that's a terribly un, uh, unraveling um, situation because they're supposed to have the best judgment. They're supposed to be the best at this. And when people are appointed who have a reputation for not being good at that, but they're political appointees, they will do what the party wants. That's really a serious problem. And I'll, the reason, I mean, the reason I like Aristotle is he gives you the reason why it's a problem. He gives you that category. Um, okay, practical wisdom is doing what's best in particular situations. And you're, you're good at deliberating, which means you can figure out, we have to make a decision here. What are the options, right? What are attainable options? And then, some people, when they're deciding what the options are, they rule out things because they think, oh, that's, that's too utopian when it actually is not. Or they include things that are really shouldn't be included. They're not real options. And that can be too utopian also. Um, or dystopian, really. So a good person who's good at this knows what the real options are that, that are attainable choices, possible choices. Then they know which choice is best and they know why it's best. And then they can argue, they can defend their, they have good, good arguments. Um, and that's really, really hard, um, but you have to practice at it. That's why people should be talking about political things. And that's why it's sad if, excuse me, as students at Lyon come to Lyon polarized already and they, they, they don't really get into meaningful conversations because college is a time, it's a chance to do that. Sorry, um, let's see, uh, there's still a lot of stuff. Um, then there's knowing what's best. Um, 
there's a person who has complete integrity. Then there's the person who has is morally strong. Okay, they they don't necessarily want to do what's right, but they do it. Okay, okay, I'll do it. I'll study. I don't want to study, but I'll do it. Um, morally weak is that I really ought to, but I don't want to, and then you don't do it. And then self indulgent is you don't even know what the good is. So that would be somebody who thinks greed is good, and that's their goal in life. Um, all right, let's see. The object of choice. There's just a lot of other stuff. Um, and I put that in there for you to just mull around in your heads. Um, let's do the Sermon on the Mount. I'm not going to do the whole thing because we're going to get to this first part later on when we do Buddha. So I won't do that. Um, I'll, the Beatitudes. This is important because all wisdom tradition, including the Greeks, have there's the world of appearance, and then there's the world of reality, which is beneath the appearances. So the world of appearances, it looks like people are superficial. It looks like all they care about is sex, money, power, and the fear of death. But you have to go underneath that and you have to find out what are their real goals in life. Um, and also the people who are, you know, a poor on earth are rich in heaven. The people who are, you know, um, people who mourn will be comforted. The meek, right? People who are humble are actually honored by God. So there's a, you, you develop an eye of the soul where you're looking for the spiritual realm, not just the physical realm. And that's important. All wisdom literature is like that. Uh, another point is that Jesus got accused of trying to undermine the Jewish laws. And he said, no, I want to get back to the spirit of the law, which is love God, love your neighbor as yourself. That's the essence of all the law and the prophets. And so there's this ten tendency to focus, to be rigid and focus on orthodoxy and focus on doctrine. You don't believe this, you're not a Christian, right? As opposed to, wait a sec, if you love God, love your neighbor as yourself, you're a Christian, you can call yourself anything. Um, murder. Um, and I want, now I want to ask you, are Americans, do they have a reputation for being good Christians on, according to Jesus's teachings? Okay. It is said, you shall not murder. I tell you, anyone who's angry will be judged. Don't even be angry. Are Americans never angry? Adultery. It is said, don't commit adultery. I say anyone in, who even looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery. Do Americans never look at women lustfully? That's what Jesus said. So the next time you have a kid saying, but Jesus said, I'll say, yeah, I'll tell you a lot of what Jesus said. <laughs> what about divorce? You're not supposed to divorce except for immorality, right? Adultery. Okay, is that true? Is that the way Americans are who claim to be Christian? Um, don't ever use the name of the Lord in vain. Yes. Eye for an eye, right? Don't, you should forgive people. Go, you know, if someone takes your coat, give them your cloak. Is that how Americans are? Uh, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Is that how Americans are? Um, give to the needy, but do it in secret, right? Mia, <laughs> without that ulterior motive. Okay, Jesus gets that, right? Uh, prayer, pray in secret. We don't, you don't need to show off. Uh, fast in secret, store up your treasures in heaven. How about this? Don't worry about what you're going to wear. Don't worry about money. Don't be anxious about money. Is that the way Americans are? Um, 
don't judge other people. Okay, true and false prophets. Make sure that you don't get sucked into somebody who claims to be a Christian preacher and is not. Um, all right, that's enough. Do you think Americans have a reputation for being good Christians? What do you think? I mean, I think there's a lot of them, but that's not how we come across in the media, right? Does that make sense? But I think, you know, our social media posts don't exactly make us look like big Christians, do they? So my main point is that it's worrisome. It's worrisome when people claim to be Christian and they're clearly not, right? Because then you lose respect for any kind of morality after a while. You just, everybody's a hypocrite. I can do whatever I want. That's what happened in Athens. Do you remember everybody just decided that freedom means a freedom to get rich? This is just human nature. I mean, that's how it degenerated. Um, so, let me try. Um, so this is comparing Jesus and Socrates, that they both had some idea of a God. They were both self-controlled. They're courageous. They stood up to the authorities, right? Both of them. So in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is calling the Sadducees were the mega church guys, and the Pharisees are the fundamentalists. And he's calling them both out as hypocrites. Um, and, and Socrates did that too, right? He didn't call them out. He just asked them questions and they, they exposed their ignorance and then they blamed him. <laughs> uh, they didn't get angry. Socrates and Jesus, they didn't get angry. Um, they both knew that what they did was honorable, but they didn't seek honor. They were both ambitious in the sense that they spoke out. They were poor, they were not privileged, but they spoke out against the privileged. Um, they called out people for blaming other people rather than looking at themselves. Um, they both had friends who understood them and loved them. But I would say in both cases, when they died, they really didn't know if anybody understood them. Jesus knew that Peter would betray him, you know? So I think they died not knowing. They both got along with people as much as possible, but when there was hypocrisy, they spoke out. They wanted a spiritual renewal. Um, they both were humble. They knew themselves. They admitted their own capacities. They, um, their lives got caught up in political issues. So they were really focused on you know, know thyself, correct thyself. And, and if people would just be more thoughtful, then this other stuff will play out. But no, they got used for political purposes, right? Those they offended used their own legal systems to take them to court or to manipulate the masses and get Pontius Pilate to crucify Jesus. Um, the problem wasn't with the system. The problem was with the people running the system. Um, the Roman laws were separated. So, you know, when we have separation of church and state in America, there's a Bible quote for that, you know? So when people say we ought to unite church and state, it's, it's not in the Bible or it might be in one part of the Bible, it's not in all the Bible. Uh, the criminal justice system was corrupted, right? That's why they could both be condemned as criminals. Um, the applying of the laws in a specific case, right? So when the jurors applied these rules to Socrates or when Pontius Pilate, um, when the, the masses voted to have him crucified, he didn't even think it was the right judgment, but he did it. The Jews wanted it. So um, so if Socrates is the greatest gift to democracy, 
and Jesus is very similar. Is Jesus, uh, is his way of life good for a democratic society? Well, it could be if you focus on his way of life, but now that you have Christians who are really interested in domination, right? It's a kind of empire building religion. So religions can get tied to the ulterior motive of building an empire, right? Power and money. But it also, if you just look at Jesus' way of life, would that be democratic? Um, so the founding fathers were religious innovators. They were called atheists, right? When they set up a society that marginalized, that separated church and state. Wow, that was considered just horrible. Um, some of them are Trinitarians. Um, I mean, some of them are Unitarian, which is basically Jesus wasn't the Messiah. Um, they were college educated, so they knew the Greek and Roman stuff. Church of England, United Reason and Faith. Um, so I just have those patterns in human affairs, the way that a perfectly decent tradition can get corrupted when it becomes institutionalized and turns into a doctrine. Um, so there were these other questions if you wanted to go through them, but we have a couple minutes and I wanted each of you to do some kind of a takeaway or reaction to what we covered today. So Mia, what do you think, what stands out to you that we covered today? It's like you to unmute, oh, there we go. Um, I just kind of like talking about the, specifically like when you mentioned like Christianity and like how people like, just talking about how like people kind of identify as Christians, but then like their actions, like don't, like you can't, it's hard to, you can't say you're a Christian if you don't like align with the, I guess like, uh, yeah, 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 I mean, well, no, not belief system, but like I'm losing my train of thought right, right. now. It's not, okay. It's not the belief system. It's the character traits. Right, right. right. Well, so, it's just interesting because like people, I don't know, I don't know, like I kind of said at the beginning of like when we introduced ourselves is like I've always grown up in the church and I've always been like a Christian and but it's so hard for me to say that I am because when you grow up with these people who like are like these devout Christians, but then they use that like sort of uh, religion or that the, 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 the philosophy and they will like take these tiny little fragments of the Bible and be like, oh, like I can be racist because of this, or I can be homophobic because of this. Like, I don't know. I just, I like, I liked when you mentioned that, like, you can't, you specifically said like you can't be a Christian in, if your actions don't follow that. That's why I like Aristotle's virtues, right? Right. Because that's common sense that this is a virtuous way of life. And it right. is the way Jesus lived. And it is what he taught, right? And so here is, if Socrates also lives that way, is it only virtuous if Jesus lives that way and not if Socrates lives that way? <laughs> yeah. It's like I mean, when you go to buy hamburger, does it, is it different hamburger because of the wrapping paper? No. Or is it what's inside of it? Yeah. Yeah. It's like I mean, isn't thing. it a lot like a brand? Like Christianity is just a brand and you don't notice that the meat rotted? <laughs> you're, you're just looking at the, the nice brand and the color and the design. Yeah. Don't, can you understand that? It's just like branding. So that's why I like teaching Aristotle's virtues because I just think that's that's the substance of the teachings, right? And the rest is just Jesus says that you hiding behind your, you know, self-righteous stuff, right? Your rituals or whatever. He said, not everyone who says Lord, Lord, but he who does the will of the Father, right? It's how you live that matters. Um, 
Okay, Jack, what about you? Um, I thought um, the most important thing was that it's important to be self-correcting and it's okay to mess up as long as your intentions are pure and virtuous. And you will be self-correcting if you really do have those intentions, right? Because you'll still want that goal. Um, but that, again, that's a character thing. You might get tired of always trying to get it right. I don't care. <laughs> but I don't, I've always regretted it. Whenever I said, I'm not going to care, it always paid a price for that. Um, so just remember, you have to live with yourself your whole life. Good luck. But <laughs> you are creating a history. So I'm telling you this 50 years later, right? The more you do make an effort, the more you work on your character, the easier it is to live with yourself, much less the people that you didn't alienate yourself from because you stuck at it. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, yeah, I have some things that I did or felt that I regret, right? Mostly I didn't act on them, but I know I have them in here and that's bad enough. So you guys go out and do better than I did, okay? Okay, bye-bye, do what I say. <laughs> <laughs>